250 box challenge, the challenge, drawing boxes. Welcome to the Crucible. If you haven't completed lesson one yet, I'd recommend you go and do that first. This exercise is probably what Drawbox is best known for and perhaps most reviled. Which is kind of unfortunate given that it's a pretty basic exercise. As one might imagine, you draw a box, then do it again another 249 times. I cover it partially in my notes about the organic perspective exercise, but before we get to drawing, I don't want you leaving thinking that this is all there is to the exercise. Some people rush off without getting all the instructions and fail to make the most of the arduous task. There's a little more to it which is explained in the video as well as below. I like the little demon Urshad. Alright. Drawing through your forms. This exercise is all about developing your understanding of 3D space and how forms can be manipulated within it. In order to do this most effectively, we can't be thinking about what we draw as being lines on a flat page or simple flat shapes. We need to work towards understanding how each form sits in 3D space. Do you want me to do that right now? Okay. The first step towards this is to draw through our forms. That is, drawing all the edges, including those that we cannot see. Think of it like you have x-ray vision. We already did some of this in lesson one. You see, you can see what that looks like. Okay. Doing this focus forces us to understand to a much greater degree how the forms we draw exist in space. You may find it difficult to do so and may find that oftentimes the back corner fails to fit within the rest. This is completely normal. As we draw a box, we regularly make small mistakes in our angles and trajectories of our edges. We compensate for them as we continue to build out our box. This accumulation of mistakes always falls on the lines that have yet to be drawn, and if we're not drawing through them, it becomes quite easy to get by without having to deal with the issues present. Once we draw that back corner, however, we're forced to come to terms with our blunders. Okay, now we're going to go look at the Y method in the organic perspective exercise notes. Is it somewhere in here? I mean, there's this Y. Oh, look. Okay. So, I'll just read this. So, all right, we're going to start with one box. For that box, find the corner that is going to be closest to the viewer and draw out each of the lines coming off of that corner. Oh, okay, we'll find then. Bleh. So draw the corner that's closest to the viewer. And then you want three lines from that corner going off towards their own vanishing point. After which, we make our little swastika. I, I'm, I'm just kidding, but we do make a new line that is trying to converge towards the vanishing point of the first lines that we made. So, and then after we've done all this, the only thing left to do is complete the box. 
Except, in this case, we have the extra step of having to draw through the boxes, which means we would go in and do the back part. So that we can draw through, so we draw through it and then grade them later. What it? What is this? Oh. I had the menu open. Anyway. Welcome to my crummy reading today. That's all right. <clears throat> so, after we've finished the box, the next part is to check our convergences. Noticing and identifying our mistakes is a major part of the learning process, and sometimes it's not necessarily something we can pick up on easily with the naked eye. For this reason, I recommend that you apply the following technique to each and every box you draw for this challenge. Once you've completed drawing a page of boxes, grab a pen of a different color and a ruler and start extending your lines back in space, meaning towards their implied vanishing points. You don't have to extend it all the way, usually this will be impossible due to vanishing points falling way off the page, but extend them as much as you reasonably can. By looking at how a given set of parallel lines, that is a set meant to converge towards a single vanishing point, actually behaves, we can identify patterns in our mistakes. So here, the lines don't actually go out to their all the way to their vanishing point, just enough to where you can see if you've made a horrible mistake. And you can see the notes, the green one has a line that's way off. The red one's pretty good. And this blue one down here, the middle lines are actually diverging instead of converging. So all your lines should be converging to like the same vanishing point. Now, do not extend in the wrong direction. As there's a lot to take in, sometimes students move forward without fully understanding what the line extension method really means, and as a result, extend their lines in the wrong direction. This gives them no useful information, leaving them uncertain and confused. Our lines must be extended away from the viewer, towards the implied vanishing point, and never towards the viewer. Make sure that when you are about to extend your lines that you think about which side of the box is pointing towards you, the viewer. Sometimes students will feel that they need to extend their lines in the direction that they converge, but this is incorrect. Sometimes because we have drawn the initial box incorrectly, our lines will diverge as they move farther away from us. This is the kind of mistake we're trying to identify by extending the lines. Since we apply this technique after we've completed a full page of boxes, it may be a little difficult to identify which side of the box is which since we're drawing through our boxes. In order to avoid this, you can fill one of the faces pointing towards the viewer with tight hatching, as shown in the examples, as well as in the next section, when you draw the box itself. That way, when you come back to it, its oriented in orientation in space will be much clearer. So. Here we have some poorly drawn boxes. We're going to apply the align extension technique to check them for mistakes. Sometimes students will accidentally extend lines in the wrong direction. We want to extend them away from the viewer towards the vanishing point to test how they converge towards the vanishing point. These are wrong. <laughs> so in this upper left, the red lines extend towards the viewer, which is the wrong direction. And to the right, the blue lines are extended in the wrong direction. They should be going the opposite way. And then here, the green lines are extended towards the viewer away from the vanishing point, and that also gives us no useful information. Now these three boxes are all extended correctly. You can see the lines move away from the viewer. So that way you can see how well of a job you've done. All right. Now, line weight. 
One technique that is extremely useful both in reinforcing the illusion of solidity in our forms and in helping to organize our line work and clarify how different forms overlap is the use of line weight. Basically, it means making certain lines thicker than others by going back over them with a confident planned stroke. When adding line weight to a box, there are a few things to remember. Firstly, weight is relative. You're not going to you're not going in to make one line extremely bold on its own. You're going in to make it subtly thicker than another. This doesn't require the addition of much extra thickness, just enough to set it apart. Our subconscious will pick up on this difference even if our eyes don't immediately, and will understand the hierarchy this is creating. So, the box on the left is too uniform. This is how you construct your box, but it's not done yet. This box to the right has added weight to internal lines, and this breaks the cohesion of the form, and it feels more like individual lines rather than one cohesive form. So don't do this. And then now here to the left, there's too much line weight. You need to be subtle. Line weight whispers to the subconscious, do not shout. And finally to the right here, this is a correct box. Subtle line weight around the silhouette reinforcing the form and filling the front facing plane with tight hatching clarifies which side faces the viewer. And that way when you come back after a page is done and extend your lines, you know how to start. All right. So secondly, use the line weight to create a solid silhouette. This means focusing that weight along the outer edges of your form. If you focus the weight on the internal edges, you'll give the impression that your box is really just a loose collection of lines. Adding them to the silhouette, on the other hand, will enclose them into a single cohesive group. Now, foreshortening. As explained in the extra box notes of lesson one, which I think is a video, a box with a lot of dramatic rapid foreshortening with its vanishing points positioned close to the form itself is going to suggest a very large scale or an object that is right up to the viewer's eye. Alternatively, shallower foreshortening with far off vanishing points and minimal convergence towards them is going to imply that an object is either at a more human scale or simply far away. I want you to make sure you practice both of these, perhaps with a bit more of a lean towards the shallower foreshortening. These will be especially relevant in later lessons as we use boxes to construct more complex objects, due to most things we're drawing not being so immensely large. Still, it is valuable to get used to both situations as they both pose different kinds of challenges. So the left has the dramatic foreshortening and the right has the shallow. So in order to complete this challenge, you must draw the following and either fine liner, felt tip pen ideally, or ballpoint pen. Don't, don't use ballpoint. 250 boxes, drawing through each one and applying the line extension method to check for errors after completing each page, not after each box. Width of opposite ends. This was initially pointed out in the cylinder challenge, but is entirely relevant here as well, as explained back in Lesson 1's ellipses. If you have a plane in 3D space and you turn that plane slowly to face away from you, it will steadily get narrower and narrower. In terms of an ellipse enclosed within that plane, this is the degree of that ellipse gradually decreasing. When we have a box floating in 3D space, Unless you're looking right down the barrel of one of its faces, either end of the box is going to be sitting at a slightly different orientation relative to the viewer. That is, the angle of the plane's orientation in space will be different. The more space there is between these faces, the more different that orientation will be. This goes for any of the three pairs of faces in a box. 
As a result, the farther end of the box is always going to be wider and therefore be oriented more towards the viewer than the closer end. This is important to keep in mind when thinking of how your boxes fit in 3D space. Generally speaking, the idea of the proportional width, we're not talking about overall size, just the width in proportion to the plane scale, being related to a flat surface's orientation in space is pretty important and will come up in cylinders as well as any kind of cross section of a form. And then there's a picture. The farther face of the box or cylinder will always be more turned towards the viewer, resulting in that face being proportionally wider or a higher degree in an ellipse. This is entirely separate from it being smaller overall due to its greater distance. 